Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Arginex. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I am Nils Erik Ullus, Professor of Neurology at the University of Bergen, Haukeland University Hospital in Bergen, Norway. Welcome to all of you to this program, which we have titled Neonatal FC Receptors in IgG-mediated Autoimmune Disorders, looking at a common denominator. Joining me today are Nicola Cooper, who is a senior lecturer and honorary consultant hematologist at the Hammersmith Hospital, Imperial College in London, UK, Enno Schmidt, Professor of Dermatology at the Department of Dermatology, University of Lübeck in Lübeck, Germany, and also Didi Morel, Professor and Head of Department of Dermatology at the St. George Hospital in Sydney, Australia. Welcome to this uh, session. We'll start by looking at the role of immunoglobulins. And uh, these uh, immunoglobulins are essential components of the immune response. There are five immunoglobulin types. Uh, IgG is the most dominating one. It has the uh, ability to bind to infectious uh, particles and to protect us, especially in the secondary immune response to pathogens. It's also the only immunoglobulin that uh, crosses placenta, so it also protects the newborn with mother's IgG. Furthermore, we have uh, IgM, which is especially important in the primary immune response. We have uh, IgA, which uh, is uh, present on the mucous membranes and have a protective role there. IgE, which uh, can cause or is implicated in allergic reactions and also protects us against uh, parasites. And we have IgD. IgG is uh, especially interesting and it accounts for uh, three fourths of the total immunoglobulin content in plasma. And it's then the most prevalent antibody class. It's also the longest lifespan it's a half-life of between three and four weeks. And as I mentioned, it crosses a placental barrier. It neutralizes and attacks the virus and bacteria and other infectious particles. However, IgG has also a potential pathogenic role as IgG autoantibodies, antibodies against our own tissues. They can be mediators of several disorders, such as myasthenia gravis, immune thrombocytopenia, pemphigus vulgaris, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. IgG is really linked to the neonatal FC receptor, the FCRN, and it interacts with this receptor. And now, Enno, will you tell us about the role of the neonatal FC receptor in human immunity and how it regulates IgG levels? Yeah, thank you very much. That, that is really an important uh, question. Um, the neonatal FC receptor is a transmembrane molecule and its three extracellular alpha chains uh, resemble uh, the MHC class one molecule. 
And uh, by these uh, three alpha chains, uh, the molecule non covalently associates with beta 2 microglobulin. And this heterotrimer then uh, binds albumin and IgG. And really, as we know so far, the most important function of FCN is the recycling of IgG. And by this, the IgG in the circulation has a half life of about three weeks. And importantly, uh, IgA, IgM, and IgE is not touched by FCN. And uh, this really takes place in endothelial cells, but also in monocytes and macrophages. And uh, IgG and also small immune complexes of IgG are taken up via pinocytosis to so-called endosomes. And in the acidic environment of these endosomes, FCN binds to IgG. And uh, by this, IgG is rescued from degradation. But when uh, FCN is uh, saturated, the surplus IgG is then degraded. And that is, of course, relevant if you block the FCN, then you have a lot of unbound IgG and a high rate of IgG degradation. Mm, but uh, we have more than this uh, for FCN functions. Uh, similar mechanisms allow the recycling of albumin and also the recycling of larger IgG immune complexes. I would like to shortly touch on another function of FCN, that is the transport of uh, IgG from the maternal uh, circulation to the fetal circulation, something that is called transcytosis. And uh, I have already mentioned shortly that also um, cells of the immune system express FCN, excluding, I have to say, uh, T cells and uh, NK cells. And by this, several active immune function have been described, for example, the cytochrome release from macrophages and also antigen presentation uh, of dendritic cells to CD4 positive T cells. Yeah. Thank you for this, Anno. Now let's have a look at the pathogenic IgG autoantibodies related to the different autoimmune diseases. And I will start by looking at myasthenia gravis and generalized myasthenia. In generalized myasthenia gravis, the pathogenic IgG autoantibodies, they bind in the postsynaptic membrane and their binding induces the typical weakness and fatigue for the patients in their muscles. The IgG antibodies, they bind to receptors or proteins at the neuromuscular junction in the postsynaptic membrane, and they cause failure of the neuromuscular signal transduction so that the muscle will not contract and you'll have the typical weakness. In 85% of the patients, we will find antibodies that are directed against the acetylcholine receptor. And uh, these antibodies, they uh, are of the IgG1 and uh, IgG3 subtypes. When the antibody bind to the acetylcholine receptor, they will block the receptor. And even more important, they will cross-link the acetylcholine receptor molecules so that they will be degraded. And the third mechanism of action is that these IgG antibodies, when binding, will activate complement. And then this complement activation will induce destruction of the receptor and structural changes in the postsynaptic membrane. So the result of the antibody binding in the postsynaptic membrane will be a reduction in function and number of acetylcholine receptors, failure of neuronal transmission, and muscle weakness 
experienced by the patient. So that was my stenia and Didi. Let's have a look now at Pemphigus vulgaris. What is the role of IgG autobodies in this condition? Pemphigus is a rare but potentially fatal condition which first affects the mucous membranes usually and then may or may not spread to the skin before it's recognized. When it first starts, it can look like gingivitis as in this photograph, but then later spread to the face and the scalp, the chest, and then even the lips as you see here. And some forms of it start in the skin and look very flaky because the uh, blisters are so superficial where it's often mistaken for a scaly condition such as psoriasis. The disease is driven by IgG autoantibodies, which attack parts of the skin and mucous membrane. In this schematic, you see in the basement membrane separating the epidermis, which regenerates itself from the dermis below. The basal cells are connected to the cells above them as they differentiate by these buttons called desmosomes. And the nucleus is connected to these structures with a scaffolding network of keratin fibers. As the skin cells move from the basal layer through the spinous layer to the granular layer and then desquamate in the stratum corneum, the proteins change, the keratins change, and the button proteins change. Desmoglein 3 is concentrated in the basal layer of the skin, and desmoglein 1 is in the outer layers of the skin. And hence, autoantibodies that attack these two proteins in the skin can cause different layers of blistering, as we'll see in a minute. Mucosa, on the other hand, doesn't have the stratum corneum or the stratum granulosum, and therefore hardly any desmoglein 1 in the mucous membranes. And hence, there's nothing to peel off in those cells. And so it's only the antibodies to desmoglein 3 which will be causing mucous membrane involvement in pemphigus. When you look at these structures in more detail, um, you can see the little desmosomes which connect the red keratin fibers cell to cell, holding hands across cell to cell to give the skin its strength, which has to withstand forces when you're walking, when you're holding hands, when you're lifting something, and when your skin is moving, when you're smiling. So you can understand that if IgG antibodies are attacking this structure, it will destabilize it and start to make these cells come apart. Here we see in the schematic, these glue proteins, so-called desmogliens and desmocollins. And in pemphigus, most of the IgG autoantibodies are directed towards these desmogliens forcing them apart and therefore the cells separate. Here, what you're looking at is a biopsy of the skin of a patient with pemphigus. And you're seeing autoantibodies highlighted in green and where they're binding to. In the left-hand panel, you can see antibodies against desmoglein 1, which are predominantly in the outer part of the epidermis, whilst antibodies to desmoglein 3 in the middle panel are mainly in the basal part of the epidermis. Hence, when you have pemphigus and you have these pathogenic IgG antibodies, they interfere between the binding of the desmoglein proteins and cause both the skin and the mucous membrane to come apart. Thank you, Didi. Let's now switch to Eno. What is the role of IgG antibodies and this dermatological disorder, pemphigoid? Thank you, Niels, uh, for this question. Our uh, autoantibodies in Bullis pemphigoid are uh, directed against uh, two proteins of the dermal epidermal uh, junction. And uh, the major autoantigen really is uh, BB180, also termed type 17 collagen. And uh, this is a 180 kilodalton transmembrane protein. Uh, localized in the basal keratinocytes, an autoantibody bind to uh, an immunodominant region just outside uh, the transmembrane region. And uh, the second target engine is the 230 kilodalton bolus pemphigoid antigen, BB230, 
that is an intracellular protein. Not the antibodies, bullous pemphigoid, are mainly of the IgG isotype. But in contrast to pemphigoids, the binding of these IgG autoantibodies against these two uh, proteins alone is not sufficient for blister formation. Here, complement activation at the dermal epidermal junction is required. And by this, inflammatory cells like neutrophils, eosins, lymphocytes, and macrophages are attracted to the upper dermis. And here, by the release of reactive oxygen species and specific proteases, this region is degraded which clinically manifests as blisters. So clinically, bolus pemphigoid is characterized by tense blisters, erosion, and severe itch. And in many patients, we also have urticarial erythematous plux. And our patient population here is really elderly with a mean age of 75 years at time of diagnosis. And uh, not only the age makes this uh, patient population a little bit fragile to come to this later uh, uh, current treatment options, but also there's uh, a high association with uh, neurological and psychiatric diseases that is found in about a third to even a half of our patients. And that is also reflected by the two to three fold higher mortality of bullous pemphigoid patients. Thank you. We have heard now how IgG autoantibodies are involved in a couple of skin diseases. And let me now ask uh, our hematologist expert, Nicola, what is the role of IgG autoantibodies in immune thrombocytopenic purpura? Thank you, Niels, for this question. So immune thrombocytopenia, or ITP, is an acquired autoimmune disease resulting in thrombocytopenia and resulting in either bleeding due to thrombocytopenia and conversely thrombosis. Earlier studies of the pathogenesis of ITP identified antibodies as being a prime part of the pathogenesis of ITP and IgG um, autoantibodies are detected in at least two thirds of patients with ITP. Although antibodies are not diagnostic and prognostic for ITP, they are certainly an important part in many patients with ITP. These IgG autoantibodies can target the surface glycoproteins expressed on both platelets as well as megakaryocytes. So IgG autoantibodies can contribute to the premature destruction of antibody coated platelets by macrophages in the spleen, liver, and possibly in the bone marrow. It's possible they also cause direct platelet apoptosis and also impair the production of platelets by megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. And we know that antibodies are important in the pathogenesis of ITP because of the therapeutic responses to treatments such as B cell depletion therapies or splenectomy. Autoantibodies are also involved in another neurological disorder that is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy or CIDP. CIDP is an acquired immune mediated neuropathy. It affects peripheral nerves where it leads to muscle weakness and to sensory loss. And uh, it's a damage to the peripheral nerves and even to some nerve roots. And this is a result of humoral mechanisms, but not in addition cell mediated immunity. And this autoimmune etiology is supported by a clear effect of immunoactive treatments, such as the intravenous immunoglobulin and corticosteroids, and also plasma exchange and rituximab. Humoral immunity is implicated in CIDP by several aspects, including the demonstration of immunoglobulin and complement deposition on myelinated nerve fibers, and uh, even passive transfer experiments uh, where uh, conduction block and demyelination is induced in rats 
after they are injected with purified IgG or serum from human patients with CIDP. However, in CIDP, uh, specific autoantibodies against uh, the myelin or, or nerve components have not been detected in a majority of patients. This in contrast to, for example, myosin nevrovis, where we have this disease-inducing acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Because of the involvement of IgG autoantibodies in these different diseases that you had heard about, uh, the blockade of FCRN or the modulation of FCRN of these uh, receptors should be a potential treatment because this such blockade will reduce the concentration of IgG autoantibodies and IgG in general. In the normal condition, IgG is taken up binds to the FCRN and is recycled into the circulation. And only a fraction is degraded in the lysosome and is not recycled. If we add the antagonist, the drug, this will bind to the FCRN and block FCRN function and unbind IgG all subtypes, including the pathogenic autoantibodies, will to a larger degree be degraded in the lysosome. That means that less IgG is uh, going back into the circulation and it will be a reduction of the IgG concentration, both of autoantibodies and of other types of IgGs. In myasthenia gravis specifically, the reduction in total IgG leads to less anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Less antibodies are available, and that means less antibodies also in the synapse, with the result of less acetylcholine receptor activation in the postsynaptic membrane, and a prevention of the acetylcholine receptor downmodulation which is induced by the autoantibodies. It will also be a, a partial prevention of complement activation at the synapse. And blocking of the FCRN acts early in the pathogenic pathway. It, it will act even before the binding of uh, antibodies in the synapse. So if we are able to prevent the binding of acetylcholine receptor antibodies will prevent all the damage in the, in the postsynaptic membrane in the synapse. NO, does the blockade of FCRN affect other immunoglobulins? Yes, I think that, that's a really relevant question uh, because FCN blocking uh, only affects IgG. So it doesn't touch IgA, IgE, or IgM. And that is, of course, relevant uh, so that the general protection against infectious diseases is maintained. Also, at least 20 to 30 percent of normal IgG levels are kept during treatment of uh, FCN uh, inhibition. IgG levels uh, return to baseline very rapidly after stopping FCN treatment. And as such, uh, patients can still build an immune response during FCN inhibitor treatment. Uh, the risk of infections with FCN inhibitors uh, is, is less compared to treatment with uh, B-cell depletion or uh, broader immunosuppressants. But of course, we have to follow uh, these safety data up when we have uh, larger patient populations treated with this uh, new uh, modality. The FCRN inhibitors have another interesting mode of action. It will uh, block the transport of IgG from mother to child during pregnancy. 
IgG is needed by the newborn as a protection. So this is theoretically a bad thing about the FCRN inhibitor. However, the, block, the blocking agent will also prevent the pathogenic autoantibodies to pass over placenta into the child. And that would be a good thing, especially in myasthenia gravis, where mother's antibodies rarely can induce uh, malformations or uh, changes in the neonates FC receptors and acetylcholine receptors and muscle. So we do not yet know if FCRN blockers may have a beneficial potential during uh, pregnancy in some autoimmune disorders. Niels, in uh, myasthenia gravis, you already have FCN inhibitor approved and also complement inhibitor agents. How is the different mode of action of these approved agents impacting the safety profile? Yeah, that's true. Uh, both uh, treating doctors and even more so patients are lucky to have access to several new treatments, both FCRN inhibitors and complement inhibitor agents that are approved for treatment. Uh, for the FCRN uh, blockers, they are acting relatively early in the pathogenic pathway. They, as I've mentioned previously, they uh, prevent binding or they reduce binding of uh, IgG antibodies in the postsynaptic membrane to the acetylcholine receptor. So uh, if the, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies are not there to bind, there'll be no pathogenic uh, action at all in the postsynaptic membrane. Regarding safety, that uh, it's only selectively IgGs that are reduced, we still will have IgM, IgA, and IgD to protect against infections. We have a good treatment for myasthenia gravis today. Standard treatments, uh, most patients do well on standard treatments. Most patients have uh, mild or moderate uh, symptoms only. However, there are also several limitations. Uh, at least 10%, perhaps 15% of myasthenia gravis patients are really difficult to treat and then continue to have uh, marked weakness even with best current treatment. Uh, even those with mild symptoms have reduced quality of life. They are often afraid of uh, or fear exacerbations in the future. And quite often they have side effects of current treatment, especially corticosteroids. You are well aware that these side effects are dose dependent and that is a challenge for many of the autoimmune disorders. Let me now ask our experts to comment on why new and better therapies, more targeted therapies are needed for their disorders. Right, for bullous pemphigoid, uh, we still have the dilemma that uh, we still work with the treatment options that have been available, available for the last 30 years, I have to say. So the backbone uh, of treatment in bullous pemphigoid are a super potent topical corticosteroids and also systemic corticosteroids. Are uh, usually uh, in moderate and severe bullous pemphigoid prednisolone at initial dose of 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day is started. And this, most physicians will combine with potentially corticosteroids bearing immunomodulants or immunosuppressants. The highest evidence really comes for these, for Dapsone and for doxycycline. But for Dapsone, uh, we have to have regular uh, blood controls, uh, in particular for, um, for uh, depletion of 
uh, red blood and uh, white blood cells. And also we have to monitor uh, the increases of liver enzymes. And for doxycycline, we know it's relatively weak drug. Alternatively, methotrexate, uh, azathioprine, or mycophenolate mofetil can be used. But we know that with these kind of treatments, we have a high rate of relapses. And also, uh, these drugs are associated with a high rate of adverse events. And uh, that is, of course, problematic in this fragile elderly and also comorbid patient population. So here, there's a very high medical need for effective and in particular, safer treatment options. The standard of care approved treatment for pemphigus currently consists of rituximab, which is taking three to four months to be effective. So it's combined with high doses of steroids, usually prednisone, around one milligram per kilo per day or higher. About a third of patients relapse when that high dose of steroids is tapered. The patients get side effects from these high doses of steroids. The rituximab is irreversible for about nine to 12 months once it works. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was found patients with pemphigus who receive rituximab had a five-fold higher mortality than those who were not given rituximab. Hence, a treatment which could reduce the pathogenic IgG quickly and which was given uh, intermittently and reversible would make things much safer and take away the burden of the steroids for the patients. Occasionally, IVIG is needed, but it's a very finite and expensive resource and not without its own side effects. So Standard treatment for patients with newly diagnosed ITP are steroids and IVIG treatment. For those patients who do not go into an immediate remission after first-line treatment, second-line treatments are mostly thromboperitin receptor agonists or rituximab, which is the B-cell depletion agent. For patients who are refractory to these agents, fostamatinib, which is a sick inhibitor, is all a newly licensed agent for patients with refractory disease. There are a number of other treatments such as PTK inhibition or complement inhibitions which are currently in clinical trials. So although steroids cause a response and an increase in the platelet count in about 60 to 80 percent of patients, these cause considerable adverse effects. And in patients with ITP, historically we've used very high doses of steroids causing complications such as mood swings, weight gain, as well as diabetes and long-term effect on bone density. There's a real unmet need to reduce the amount of steroids in newly diagnosed patients. Other first-line treatments are IVIG treatment. This is a blood product. It frequently causes headaches and need for a long infusion rate, often requiring hospital admissions. So a significant impact on both the patients and um, any uh, hospital provisions. Neither of these treatments are curative. There is a key unmet need for patients with newly diagnosed ITP to avoid both steroid and IVIG treatment. In patients with persistent ITP or who develop longer term ITP, thrombopoietin receptor agonists have shown very good efficacy and good tolerability. However, 30 to 40% of patients still do not have lasting response to thrombopoietin receptor agonists, and only a small number of these patients will go on to have long-lasting treatment-free responses. There is still a cohort of patients who are refractory to all licensed agents. Thank you for uh, these uh, interesting comments. And uh, now, Eno, what are these uh, new and emerging therapies that target FCRN and uh, are being developed for diseases? So far, we have five different FCN inhibitors available, and I will go through them in an alphabetic order. So the first one is really a bad talk to mob. Uh, that is currently trialed uh, in uh, myasthenia gravis in the phase 
free trial. And then we have FCA Tigemot. That is the only FCN inhibitor that is currently licensed, and that is for Myasthenia gravis. And there are several phase three trials going on at the moment. Uh, this is for pemphigoids for agaris and for yeshis. That is for bolus pemphigoid. And this is also for immune thrombocytopenic. And there's uh, also a phase uh, two trial that is currently recruiting for CIDP. And then we have nipocalimab that is currently um, explored in a phase three trial for myasthenia gravis and a phase two to three trial for CIDP. Then we have orilanunimab, um, a phase two trial in pemphigus vulgaris and foliages has been uh, completed and the data are already published. And last but not least, we have Rosanolixizumab, and that is currently uh, used in a phase three trial and myasthenia gravis, and also for immune thrombocytopenia. And uh, phase two RTC has been just completed for CIDP. Thank you for showing us these uh, very interesting new possibilities, uh, Eno. Uh, we'll now go on to the concluding remarks. And they are, first of all, that the FCRN inhibitors really do improve some IgG-mediated autoimmune disorders. And they do so by reducing the IgG concentrations in the body selectively. And this selective IgG concentration is due to a reduced recycling of IgG because the FCRN, these receptors, they are blocked by the drug. And as you've seen and heard, the FCRNs are the key elements for recycling of IgG. It's not on the other autoimmunoglobulins, but it's unselective within IgG. So it's autoantibodies, but also all other IgG antibodies in the body are reduced in concentration. Uh, we have not discussed uh, the, the clinical effects in detail, but I'll just uh, show you and include here that the FCRN inhibitors act rapidly in the patient in a couple of days in most patients. And they also seem to be safe. They will uh, probably lead to a modest increase in infection risk as all other uh, immunosuppressive uh, treatments. And it's, we are awaiting comparative studies to try to define patient groups where to use these drugs in mo more detail to compare them with, with other treatments in controlled studies. And it's also an important point to be aware of that they are expensive drugs, their availability and refunding policies will vary in countries and within some countries. Didi and Nicolon, thank you for your contribution and for this great discussion we've had. Thank you to the audience for listening to us and take part in this uh, activity. And I hope you will uh, continue on to answer the questions that uh, appear for you and uh, also complete the evaluation. Thank you. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.